Excellent. So welcome everyone. My name is uh, Mo Kabara. I am uh, the director of electrification at the Transition Accelerator. And welcome to our webinar, Deep Geothermal Superpower, Canada's potential for a breakthrough in enhanced geothermal systems. And I will be moderating today's event. So this webinar is the third event in the Transition Accelerator's monthly webinar series uh, called Pathways to Net Zero, which is really focused on uh, presenting credible and compelling transition pathways that are capable of driving uh, Canada to reach our net zero targets by 2050. And, you know, there's no doubt that reaching net zero is going to, going to be a very challenging task. It's not going to be easy. Uh, and while we don't know exactly uh, how we're going to meet those targets, uh, there's one thing that we know for certain, which is that net zero changes everything. And that means that the incremental um, reductions of emissions that we've implemented in the past uh, no longer apply in a net zero context and will not be enough to meet our climate and, ambit and our ambitious climate goals. So taking place on last Wednesday of every month uh, from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, Pathways to Net Zero, our webinar series, will feature engaging and thought-provoking expert presentations, conversations, and debates concerning the, those viable net zero uh, solutions and how they can be applied by governments, industry, and investors to help achieve Canada's climate, economic, and social goals. So this will be our last uh, uh, webinar series uh, or webinar uh, till, uh, for the summer, and then we're, we're going to be coming back in September. But for information and updates about future webinars, you can join the Transition Accelerator's mailing list by visiting transitionaccelerator.ca, or you can follow us on Twitter and, or LinkedIn. And then my colleague Jess is going to be posting those links in the chats here. So you can, uh, you can click on that and, and, and register so you can stay up to date. So for today, uh, the topic that we're going to be discussing is geothermal electricity and heat production. And as Canada and the world move towards a goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2050, as we mentioned, you know, demand for electricity is going to increase. The specifics of how big that demand is going to be may be uncertain, but one thing is clear is that it's going to take a, a very, very big uh, and significant change to the, our current electricity system, to the current grid. Um, and it's going to be a, a very important lever to decarbonizing transportation, to decarbonizing our, build our buildings, our industries. So many solutions are being proposed to sort of help bridge that gap and uh, create a net zero energy system, uh, specifically a net zero electricity system. But one that has uh, so far been mainly outside of the mainstream discussions is uh, deep enhanced geothermal systems or deep uh, EGS. So this is a technology that creates uh, heat exchange reservoirs in hot, uh, dry rock more than five kilometers below the Earth's surface. And what we, we have here today with us, um, <clears throat> two experts from uh, the Cascade Institute, Canadian Research Center that identifies and helps implement high leverage interventions to address the full range of humanities converging um, to environmental, economic, political, and technological and health crises. And Deep Geothermal Superpower, which is a report published by our two experts here, uh, Ian and Thomas, look at the deep EGS opportunity, outlining you know, the important gaps that we have from an R&D perspective, technical, financial, regulatory challenges, and but ultimately makes the argument that this, this is a technology that should be considered and that Canada does have an opportunity to become a global leader uh, in, in, in deep uh, EGS. So I'm pleased to introduce today uh, Dr. Ian Graham, who's a senior fellow at the Cascade Institute and lead author of this, of this deep geothermal superpower report, and Dr. Thomas Homer Dixon, a found, the founder and director of the Cascade Institute, to discuss the deep uh, EGS opportunity that um, they laid out in their report. So throughout their presentation, I, I would say feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box and we will get to them. Uh, after the presentations and later in the webinar. And please, if you could use the Q&A box uh, for questions only rather than the chat box, as you know, this helps us keep everything in one place. And if you see a question there that, you, that resonates with you or that you like, uh, feel free to, to press the upvote uh, button for that. So this will help us sort of keep uh, 
tab on you know the questions that are most important to folks on uh, at the webinar and then we, those vote those questions kind of rise to the top and uh, will give us uh, sort of the order of the questions that uh, should be addressed. So I'll now I hand it over uh, to Thomas and Ian and uh, we really thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Mo, and uh, thank you to the Transition Accelerator for giving us this opportunity to talk to uh, an interest, interested group and an expert group across the country about this opportunity, what we're calling now ultra deep geothermal, but is technically known as deep EGS, as Mo explained. I'm going to speak for only a couple of minutes because I really want to hand over to, uh, to our technical lead on this subject, Dr. Ian Graham, who's with me here today. To say a little bit about the Cascade Institute, Mo has already outlined what we're trying to do very briefly. Uh, it was founded in the spring of 2020, so it's a, it's a new institute. Uh, we focus on identifying what we call high leverage intervention points in social, cognitive, institutional, and technological systems that can accelerate change in a positive direction, uh, climate change and the zero the just to zero energy transition are uh, central interests of the Cascade Institute. So we're looking for high leverage intervention points or what we call HLIPs that can accelerate the, uh, the just zero carbon energy transition. We have a number of projects underway, seven in total. Uh, and one of the ones that's uh, moving very fast right now is our project on ultra deep geothermal. There seems to be a considerable amount of excitement around it. Uh, and, uh, and, and this just a, a word on where this originated, but probably for two decades or so, I have uh, wondered why deep geothermal wasn't getting more attention uh, and what the technical and institutional regulatory financial obstacles might be to trying to, to bring it to a place where uh, it could contribute more substantially to uh, the provision of zero carbon energy as we go through the energy transition. And uh, so we have taken the opportunity uh, as part of this new suite of projects in the Cascade Institute to uh, investigate that question in much greater depth. And we believe that there is, uh, there is substance here that's worth exploring further, uh, that, uh, that perhaps uh, it has been unfortunate and not substantively justified that deep EGS or ultra deep geothermal has not received the attention uh, so far that uh, that might be warranted, that there's much more work to be done and an exciting opportunity for Canada here. So with that, I'll uh, pass on to Ian, who is going to go through the technical details of the report, and then we're very interested in conversation and questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. I'm going to just pull up some slides now, um, since every talk has to have slides. Great, I'm hoping everyone can see that. Um, so now I'm going to organize this talk since we don't have a lot of time into basically five questions that I think get at the heart of the issue that we want to talk about. The first one, which I think is helpful for everybody is essentially an overview of geothermal energy in general, how it works and how does natural geothermal energy, natural production of energy, let's say, compared to the engineered approach or the enhanced EGS. Secondly, I want to talk about what the challenges are today for geothermal energy. Why is it, for example, not more common everywhere in the world? There are good reasons for that, but good opportunities to remediate those reasons and actually make it a much broader technology opportunity. So I want to talk then a bit about the technology problem. What are the challenges and what are the opportunities to resolve those challenges and who's actually looking at these today? That won't be a complete list of what may in fact be the ways you can resolve it, but it's a good indication, not only of the opportunities to do so, but of the fact people are willing to invest already, invest already in trying to tackle them. Then I'll talk a bit about risks, mostly technology or to do with the risk of geothermal energy in itself. And last a bit about the opportunities for Canada out of this um, technology option. So really, you can think of geothermal, geothermal energy as being like a big steam engine. You heat the water underground, you take hot water up, you run it through a turbine to power a generator, 
then when the water is cold or cooled, you simply pump it back down underground where the natural heat of the earth reheats it and then you pump it back up again. So just like a steam turbine in a power station, it's just a closed loop system, but instead of having to heat um, carbon uh, gases like, or oil and natural gas or whatever to heat the water, you simply use the natural heat that's produced in the ground by natural processes to do the heating for you. So you essentially get a closed loop cycle that has essentially zero carbon emissions, which is really an outstanding opportunity. Indeed, there are probably around 80 gyrofilm power stations that currently exist around the planet, producing over 14 gigawatts of power, which is, I think we did a calculation, roughly twice the size of the Bruce nuclear station in Ontario. But it's known from various research studies that if you can drill sufficiently deep underground, say 12 kilometers, there is really enough thermal energy in the earth to satisfy the entire planet's energy needs literally hundreds of times over. So it's not that there's just a little bit of energy down there and we've got the best we can out of it. There's in fact an enormous amount of energy down there that if we could access it, would in fact deliver solutions to many of our electricity and thermal energy needs. The, all you need to do is get hot enough water and then the right environment deep underground to heat it up and then you're gangbusters. One of the challenges is that current drilling technology, however, is only cost effective for relatively shallow wells. You can't really deep that, dig that deep to get to the heat, which is deeper underground. Moreover, the current drilling tech is really limited to sedimentary rock, the type that oil and gas drillers drill through. What this means is that you have a very limited geographical range to where you can actually practically retrieve. Uh, geothermal energy. Essentially, really 1% of the Earth's surface, so 99% is essentially not useful. And of that 1%, it all has to be, or be near tectonic plate boundaries. I'm just going to flip quickly to the next slide to show you what I mean. Here is a map showing all of the geothermal power stations around the world. And if you follow the green dots, you can remarkably note how, for example, this follows along the, the, um, the tectonic plate boundaries along the west coast of the United States, along the uh, ring of fire up through New Guinea, up through Japan and up to Kamchatka, for example, and of course, Iceland. There are all these places where the plates are bumping into each other. And as a result, heat bubbles closer to the surface where it's accessible by current technology. Why can't we get deeper? And the answer is it just costs too much. And we'll talk a bit more about why that's the case later, but if you could dig deeper cheaply, you could enormously expand that range of geographical opportunity. You could be drilling for geothermal energy just about anywhere on the planet. And that would essentially revolutionize the whole geothermal energy business model. So if you can do that, you create an absolutely enormous potential business and energy prize for Canada, but also for the entire planet. But what do I mean by cheaper drilling? Well, it's hard to answer that question without knowing how much it, you need to, how much it costs to drill geothermal wells today in successful power stations. And we know from some data from Rystad Energy, a consulting firm, that it costs rough for successful geothermal power stations. They spend roughly five and a half million US dollars per well. So that gives us a good benchmark for knowing, okay, if I can drill a well for five and a half million dollars and get hot water out, then I can make a, an, a, an economically uh, sufficient power station. Assuming that incentives change over the next while, which they likely will, we can make that range say five to $10 million. So that's our target cost. What does it cost today, for example, to drill 10 kilometers underground through hard rock? It's hard to know for sure, but we can estimate that at roughly 50 to $100 million based on some experimental drilling work that's been done in a couple of places around the world. So what that tells us is that if we want to make deep geothermal cost effective, we need to be able to reduce the cost of drilling a 10 kilometer hole, let's say, by a factor of 10, which is a big factor, but as we'll see, is not unreasonable. So yes, we believe this is doable. And it's, we believe it is doable because this is really just a drilling technology problem. 
And because we are seeing with some of the work we're doing, and we'll talk about that a bit later, that there are already candidate technologies under development to tackle this. The main problem, there are a few, but this is the one that's, I think, the critical nut to it, is the drill bits that drill through the rock. Today's drill bits are really, really slow drilling through hard rock. And by really, really slow, I mean really slow. It can slow down by a factor of 10, 20, or 30 when the drill bit hits that hard rock. The other problem is that they wear out really quickly. And if you think about a drill that's sitting, say, three kilometers down underground, it takes a long time to pull that drill string all the way out three kilometers, put a new drill on the end, shove it back down again, and then have to do that again in, say, half a day when the thing wears out again. So both of these factors need to be fixed in order to be able to drill inexpensively and deeply into hard rock. Now, what we're going to do is look at some technologies in the next page that give you an example of what some of those uh, technologies are. Our argument here is that we need to actually develop these and other technologies to in fact make sure that we are able to do this. So here are four example technologies that are currently under development to help improve the rate at which we can drill through hard rock drilling. Uh, I've put up in little boxes inside them the names for three of these technologies of the companies that are actually working on developing them. On the uh, a thing called percussive drilling is being developed by a company called Strata Global, which is, I believe, based out of the Channel Islands in the UK, um, but has uh, development places in Britain and around the world. In this case, what they do is they have a drill bit and instead of grinding against the rock, which is what standard oil and gas drills do, this one is rather like a hammer that hammers hard against the rock, fracturing it into fragments that can then be pulled out. Such drill bits have been shown to penetrate at rates of up to 23 meters an hour, which is, you know, it's hard to put this in context when you don't know the other typical drilling rates, but this is what we would call fast through hard granite, which is one of the typical types of hard rocks you're likely to encounter when you're trying to drill deep. Now, Strata has a, um, is a private company that's relatively well-funded and is developing this technology with a focus on geothermal projects. So they are partnering with some companies that are trying to build geothermal power stations in Europe and elsewhere to test their technology. The plasma technology, which is, run, which is developed by a company called GA Drilling, which is based in Czechoslovakia, or the Czech Republic rather, um, uses the notion of high temperature plasma jets at temperatures above 2000 degrees C, which essentially spray the surface of the rock with high pressure jets of plasma, which then vaporize and or fracture the rock face because of the high heat. The result is that it breaks it up again and is easy to pull the uh, material out. One of the advantages of this technology is in principle that because the bit never touches the rock, it doesn't actually wear out. A percussive drill bit will wear out and you'll need to replace it. So plasma jets show the promise both of being able to drill effectively through hard rock, but also show the ability to hopefully last a long time and not require replacement. The thing called tripping where you have to pull the whole drill string all the way up, replace the bill and the drill bit and put a new one on. On the bottom right, there is a thing called millimeter microwave drilling, um, which has recently gotten a lot of interest through the company Quays Energy that raised roughly $40 million in a venture capital investment approximately a month and a half ago. At least that's when we first found about it. The notion behind millimeter microwave is that there are other ways to penetrate rock and fracture it so you can break it up into parts and remove it. And in their case, they're using gigahertz frequency microwave radiation from, from the tip of the drill bit that weakens and fractures the rock surface, allowing it to be easily broken up and removed using the typical techniques of current drilling practice. This is based on work that was originally done at MIT about eight or nine years ago, and which has now been, which has since then been under development by a series of small startup companies that were relatively poorly funded, as far as we can tell, Recently, much of this work is rolled under the uh, company Quays Energy, which is much more better funded by venture capital 
investment firms in the United States. And then finally, there's another technology called WaterJet, which looks at augmenting other tools of drilling, such as the percussive bits, by adding high pressure water jets. And by high pressure water jets, I mean really the very high pressure, very thin water jets that are used, for example, to cut steel or metals. The notion being that you can augment the practice of the percussive drill or other drill technologies, including um, rotary if you want, with this water jet technology to improve the efficiency and penetration rates, the rate at which it can penetrate through the rock. And there have been some successes with water jet drilling, including research work done in Canada. Um, but of course, there is still much work to do to look at developing this in combination with these other technologies and potentially others to make drilling more effective. Now, the truth of this is that none of these is going to be the perfect solution. We know from, or I should say others know since I haven't practiced in it, but we know in general that from all sorts of drilling technologies that have been used in, in uh, sedimentary rock, that you often need different types of drill bits depending on the type of rock you're trying to drill through. And it is quite likely those will be the same types of challenges that get faced in deep EGS. Therefore, we really need to require different, developing different technologies or combinations of technologies to provide us with the ability to drill, to drill consistently and reliably in a whole variety of different types of deep hard rock scenarios. From this, we can conclude that in order to actually make this all work, you need to invest in all these potential solutions that we just talked about briefly, and likely others that we have not identified in the work that we did putting this paper together. More broadly, we will also need to look longer term at other aspects of the, what I call the drilling stack, essentially all the technologies and processes that go to actually drilling a hole, because all of those play a role in the cost of how you want to, of, of the cost of actually drilling a hole and getting it ready down 10, 12 kilometers deep to pump fluid in or out. All of these are aimed essentially on one key factor, focusing on reducing how long it takes to build a well, because in drilling, essentially it's time is equal to money. But in order to do that, we first need to develop a drilling technology breakthrough to make it possible to drill quickly at all. So that's really the sequence of things we see. You need to first get the drilling technology breakthrough so you can drill with the drill bit quickly. And then you need to look at all the other aspects in the drilling stack to make sure you can optimize the cost and get down to the level that we're looking for. Now, so that's basically the notion. Um, if you can get the drilling cost down low enough, then you can make it economic. And there are technologies in place particularly in the drilling technology that should allow this to happen. Suppose we're able to do this. Are there still questions we need to ask beyond the drilling technology? And the answer of course is yes, there are several technologies and I've highlighted two of the most important ones here. First, we need to prove that EGS can work in deep, hard, uh, i.e. metamorphic or igneous rock. EGS again, just I skipped it over earlier, but I'll explain explain it right now and for those who don't know about this. EGS means that when you're building a reservoir underground to store water that you can pump up to run a turbine, you're doing that as essentially an engineering project. So you drill down into some rock deep underground that itself is probably very hard, doesn't let water permeate through it, and in fact has no water in it at all. And then you use stimulation techniques to essentially fracture the rock and allow water to flow through it from one well you drill to another well you drill. So you can pump cold water down one well, it'll then percolate through the walk, heating up, and then you can pump it up using the other well. Although I'll mention, we can talk about later about other technologies to potentially drill little pipes that allow you to do the transfer of water from cold to hot. Now, going back to the EGS scenario where you're drilling and fracturing rock, that's actually a known uh, practice. There are functioning power stations in the world that actually use that today. But we still need to show that the tech, that, that approach is viable in much deeper hard rock scenarios. The people who are in the, in the field believe that yes, that should be the case. It's just that they simply can't get down there to prove it. The second question that often comes up with geothermal and particularly enhanced geothermal is induced seismicity. That is, 
that the practice of building an EGS reservoir deep underground can cause local seismicity and surface earthquakes that can be a problem. And this is because the fluid that gets pumped down into the re reservoir can first add stress to the rock that exists underground. And secondly, can essentially act like a lubricant for the existing fractures in the rock that are in the stimulated region. So if that rock is already under stress, the rock can then slip and shift, leading to seismicity roughly down where the reservoir is built, let's say two or three or four kilometers down. And that motion of the rock down three or four kilometers may be felt at the surface as earthquakes. And there have been several cases where this is known to happen. So most of them small, a few of them larger, very similar to what's seen with oil and gas fracking, which is also done at a similar depth although with a rather more aggressive stimulation tech, you should put it. Notably, however, though, most shallow EGS projects are near tectonic plate boundaries. Because remember the first thing we talked about, that you need to have the heat close to the surface to make it work. That means you need to be near tectonic plate boundary. Where the tectonic plate boundaries are where the massive plates of the earth are bumping into each other and, or sliding past each other, which means that the rock in there in those areas is already under a huge amount of stress simply due to the tectonic plate motion. So it's far more likely you're going to find stress in the rocks in a shallow EGS station next to a tectonic plate boundary than you would find if you went, for example, to some rock in the middle of the Canadian Shield, which is thousands of miles away from the nearest plate boundary and is under much lower stress. So we believe for that reason alone, that if you can do deep EGS far from a plate boundary, it's probably a lot safer and will have a lot smaller um, uh, possibility of induced seismicity. But the other reason why it may be beneficial is simply because of depth. The surface impact of an underground earthquake decreases the deeper it is. So if you had a small seismic activity two to three kilometers down, which, had a, which you could detect on the surface, and then had a similar event 10 kilometers down, it may barely be observable because there is so much earth in between where the seismic activity happened and the surface that most of the energy is dissipated in the rock in, in, the rock in between. So it is believed that, but yet so far not proven, that far away from plate boundaries and deep underground, there is less existing stress in the deep rock so that the risk of seismicity is reduced. Now let's, talk a bit about the, what we think about the Canadian position. We believe that because the technology is so promising and because Canada has such a large industrial base based in the key technology areas of drilling, that this makes a really good opportunity to place a large industrial and R&D bet on EGS. This both helps Canada achieve our net zero electricity targets and we are convinced we need more, op more options for doing so than the ones that exist today. But it also would provide Canadian technology businesses, worldwide engineering opportunities to actually uh, develop this technology and then use it to deliver energy solutions around the world. In order to achieve that goal though, we frame how we would get there in terms of what we call aud audacious technical and business goals. These goals are designed to steer a very clear and aggressive direction towards where we want to go, to let us understand clearly what benchmarks we can put in place to measure success and make sure we're getting there, and provide a tool for focusing efforts of, our, of the people involved and the government's uh, agencies and businesses who will be tasked with uh, either funding and supporting or uh, otherwise making sure this type of work can happen. For example, one technical goal we have is we simply call, which I guess I could say I simply called because I made it up this morning, the $10 million well, which goes back to, I guess, me watching the $10 million man when I was a very young boy, but we don't have to think about that part. The notion is we've set a target, a target to drill a commercial quality geothermal well to a depth of 10 kilometers through hard rock with this temperature at the bottom of at least 250 Celsius for less than $10 million a well. If we could do that, then you basically have a roadmap cleared for DPGS. 
The other one is to create functional, economically viable EGS reservoirs at a depth of up to 10 kilometers at a commercially feasible cost. We believe that once the wells, you can drill the wells down there, that in fact, creating the wet reservoir should be straightforward. But of course, we need to prove it as a key technical goal. The other thing we want to do is we want to show that you can build geothermal wells that have a practical lifetime of over 75 years, because then you have the ability to produce really long lived, really low cost long-term energy solutions for the planet. On the business side, we have two other key goals. We want to create a world leading Canadian capacity to design, build and operate such stations so that we can actually build them in Canada and we can export that capability and sell product around the world to help the world solve their energy problems. And to support that, we want to make sure that the IP that's developed as part of this work remains a Canadian asset through Canadian Crown Corporations, the Canadian businesses that develop it, and through um, our support of making this type of work happen. Now, our first step towards these long goals is a little smaller, and that is that we want to build a broad community of interest that shares the enthusiasm and belief that we have in this technology and is interested in helping transform Canada into a global leader in DPGS. The goal of this community is uh, really covered by these five points, to help us better understand the scope and magnitude of this opportunity that we have identified, to help us solidify an understanding of the key R&D gaps, and most importantly, to help identify what the key R&D investment, in investment and policy obstacles are and what we need to do to resolve them. Also identify a possibility of portfolios of, sorry, of strategies and solutions for overcoming those obstacles. And I guess you could say underneath that, that to identify the most effective governance and incentive structures for building the innovation ecosystem that you actually need to support many parties working to develop, to develop a true deep EGS capability. One of the things we're thinking about in particular is building out an R&D pathway between the current state of drilling, how we do it today, and the target state where EGS can be competitive and competitive at scale worldwide. So that's really a summary of what we've been doing and where we stand today. Um, with that, I'd like to pass it back to, well, to Thomas and to Mo for questions and answers and discussion. Thanks, Ian. Really appreciate it. Uh, very, very interesting uh, presentation. I don't know, Thomas, do you have anything to, to add before we kind of kick off some questions? The one point that I would make, and just to supplement Ian's marvelous presentation, which was a very comprehensive summary of our 80 page report, uh, is that uh, uh, ultra deep geothermal or DPGS may have. Uh, uh, may give us the opportunity to break through what I think is a, a critical challenge for uh, uh, current uh, zero carbon or low carbon renewable energy sources, which is the power density challenge. Uh, the fact that uh, PV, solar, uh, wind, and hydro each generate uh, relatively small amount of power per square meter of of uh, the surface area of the landscape that they occupy, the, the, the facilities occupy. And we're looking at uh, power densities under 10 watts per square meter in almost all cases, and in many cases under two or three watts per square meter. Uh, this means that these, um, these alternative renewable energy sources have to take up enormous tracts of territory in order to generate the power that our complex societies need. Uh, we think that uh, with the kind of drilling breakthroughs that Ian has outlined, that we can get the power density uh, of uh, ultra deep geothermal up uh, potentially orders of magnitude higher than uh, the power densities of PV, solar, and wind uh, into the tens of watts per square meter, uh, which, which uh, means that much less uh, territory needs to be expended, and you can return more landscape to nature as a result. 
Uh, so ultimately, it's, it, there, there are issues, of course, of cost per kilowatt hour, absolutely critical issues, but there are also issues of landscape utilization that we need to take into consideration as we go forward to try to generate the huge amount of power, electrical power our societies need without producing carbon. Um, but otherwise, I'd just like to dive into questions and, uh, and discussion and see what people think. Absolutely. So before we kind of kick off uh, the Q&A from the audience, I just wanted to kind of ask a couple of questions uh, to get us started. So I, I think like if we think about the sort of paradigm or the spectrum that we have of, of uh, energy technologies and specifically renewables uh, or, or low carbon, so on one end of the spectrum, you can think, you know, we have solar, wind, nuclear, ready to go. And you mentioned, you know, that you feel like we need to be considering other options. I see, for example, you know, fusion is a solution that has been talked about for decades. And if it can work, it can be huge. But, you know, there's, there's dozens of companies working on it as billions of dollars being spent. But as, as we all know, it's, it doesn't seem to be something that we can really uh, rely on in near term or uh, even it, for me it's like every every 20 years it seems like it's coming in 20 years I guess my question is where do you see the deep EGS technology on that spectrum of you know ready to go and then fusion if we want to sort of place it relatively speaking from it from a readiness perspective do you want me to take that Pat? yeah Ian uh, yeah sure um it's not, it's not immediately available, but there are, unlike with uh, uh, fusion, actually, that's a, a side story. When I started doing my uh, master's degree in physics, one of the ideas was, to, my thoughts at the time was to study fusion research, because I thought, boy, if I do this, I'll be building reactors by the time I'm a 20, 30 year old. Clearly that hasn't quite risen to the level that I had dreamed when I was at that age. And it still seems like I, would tell the same story about a 20 year old today. That's a hugely complicated technical problem. This is actually not a hard technical problem. I mean, it may be hard to find a solution, but it's not as if you're gonna spend, as we have done probably in the last 20 years, 50 to $100 billion trying to build fusion power stations. We're talking in several orders of magnitude, smaller research endeavor, which has a high probability of succeeding because they're the gaps are relatively well understood. So I think this has a much higher probability of producing a good result than uh, fusion reactor research, for example. So in terms of specifics, uh, the PV solar and wind are rolling out right now, of course, uh, there's research investment in small modular nuclear reactors. We could have a conversation about that as an alternative. Uh, we're still likely facing a substantial uh, zero, uh, net zero carbon electricity gap going forward, even with those technologies, especially around the world. Um, Canada might be relatively well off, but we're going to be occupying a lot of our landscape with solar panels and wind turbines to do this. Uh, so, uh, it, it, you know, we're looking at a timeline of somewhere within the next uh, 15 years to two decades to actually bringing this technology to scale, where it's where it's generating a substantial, a substantial contribution to the grid. Um, we think that that's, uh, that is potentially doable, which is certainly a lot shorter than fusion. Fusion, you said it's always 20 years in the future. It seems to me it's always 50 years in the future. Uh, and, uh, and, and that means that you know, we may be building out some of these large uh, conventional arrays of turbines and and uh, solar PV systems, but uh, you know, at some point we may, might be able to dismantle them and as I say, return that landscape to nature uh, because we have higher power, de power density option at that point. And, and one thing I'd say additionally is that by using ultra deep geothermal, you're essentially tapping the heat of the core of the earth, which is substantially generated by uh, nuclear decay and, and uh, you have essentially kind of a nuclear reactor at the core of the earth which is extraordinarily well shielded by the mantle and the crust. Rather than building a whole, you know, hundreds of small or large reactors across the surface of the planet with all the attendant issues related to waste disposal and, and nimbyism and the like, uh, mm. 
and proliferation, potential proliferation problems, why don't we tap the heat of the best shielded reactor on the planet and use that to power civilization pretty well indefinitely into the future? Uh, this could be the source of power for humanity forever. And it, in some ways, it's also a, it, it's a balancing of risks. Tad's, I, Thomas has identified some of the important risks about uh, small, nu portable, small nu modular reactors or nuclear in general. Um, but if we even look at voltaic or even hydroelectric stations, as the climate changes, we're going to find regions where you have substantial reductions in rainfall. And as we're already finding, as seeing in parts of the United States, whole areas of the country where they're having to go through power conservation simply because the reservoirs aren't full enough to power a power station. All of the mechanisms that we have to generate power today that are, well, I think hydroelectric, solar, are all dependent on climate conditions staying more or less the way they are. If the climate doesn't change the way they are, then all of these other technology mechanisms are at risk. And we have not at all thought about what we're gonna do, for example, if you end up with hurricanes blowing through Southern Ontario that blow down all the power stations, or we end up with heavier rainfall or less rainfall in areas that we're critically dependent on to fill, for example, all of the hydroelectric dams in British Columbia. And those are also, I mean, obviously one can't forecast what's going to happen, but mm -hmm. one can foresee risks and one should manage for risks as opposed to hoping that they just don't happen. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we spent a little bit of time uh, identifying some of the climate vulnerabilities of these uh, conventional renewable energy sources. So as we've seen in Europe recently, last year you get these heat domes and the wind disappears and the turbines aren't turning and all of a sudden you have a critical short, shortfall of power. It's, it's likely that we're going to see those kinds of weather events in the future. Major hailstorms can destroy uh, solar, solar arrays very quickly. Uh, they're very vulnerable to high velocity winds uh, that which we're going to be seeing more of in the future. So the thing about an ultra deep geothermal plant is that because it has a relatively small hard profile on the surface of the planet, it's less vulnerable to climate change. And if for some reason it gets shut down, it's not like a nuclear power plant where you have to worry about uh, whether the systems are stable if uh, if if the uh, the larger grid. Uh, shuts down or the pumps don't work anymore. If a, a, a geothermal plant's pumps stop working, it just stops working and then you can fire it up later. So mm -hmm. it's a much more resilient technology, we think. That's, that's yeah, thanks, thanks for that. I guess it kind of brings me to uh, the next question, which is in the context of a 2035 net zero electricity system target uh, in a context of a net zero by 2050 with growing electricity demand from the electrification of transportation and and uh, buildings and industry, you know, um, how do you how do you see the technology fitting in in that context? Given that there's a maturity concern and uncertainty around the timeline for 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 the maturity, like how do we how do we integrate this this the this level of uncertainty in our uh, so that it fits with our within the targets that we're trying to accomplish uh, in the next you know twelve to to, to twenty five years. The, I guess the, the best way to put it is that, well, I guess that there's, there's the, the simple if facile answer is to say, well, if it's a good idea, if it's going to take a year longer than you, your critical timeline says, you should still do it because it's actually going to give you the better solution long-term. And one of our going in positions is that this gives you a really good long-term solution. So not working on it is a bit, is just, well, in some ways, having done all this work, it feels a bit crazy because you can see how tantalizing this opportunity is. You can see how straightforward it is to actually get to the end. It's going to take some time to get there, but you still should be doing it because if everything else doesn't play out the way you think it is, then you need to, you will have this opportunity available when the time comes and you need it. Um, I think a second part would be is that um, you don't really know what the future is going to bring. So you need to bring all of the opportunities to the table so that 
if things go better than you, you expected, then okay, maybe it wasn't that important. But if things don't go as well as you expected, then you've managed that risk as well. And you've got something on the table that you can actually bring to the table and solve problems. I think we've often been focused on doing what we know how to do and not actually solving the big problems of finding the right ways, the better ways to do this, that both serve Canada's interests from a power and energy perspective, but also serve the world's interests as by providing a new capability that can substantially transform things everywhere, not just here. I think it's at one point, you know, one of the reports that we cite, the foundational report came out of MIT in 2006 that basically identified the, the, the potential here, the amount of heat that could be tapped around the world. And uh, it made the very, very strong assertion at that point that this is an opportunity that should be investigated much more vigorously. And now we're um, many years later, over 15 years later, and uh, that opportunity uh, hasn't received the attention that it deserves. I don't think the delay should be a reason because it induces uncertainty to simply not push forward as aggressively as possible. We now realize, I think much more acutely, just how significant the net zero electricity gap is going to be. And uh, we need to have, as Ian's been suggesting, uh, every option on the table because uh, it may turn out that uh, some of the bets we're making uh, aren't as uh, viable as we expect they will be, or they have uh, consequences that we don't like. Um, some of the ones that we've just been talking about in terms of climate vulnerability of, of uh, conventional renewable systems, for example. Um, so just because we're late to the game doesn't mean we shouldn't do it at this stage. That would be a classic example of what, what complex systems theorists call pernicious path dependency, that we're just accepting that we're locked into a certain pathway and we have to continue pursuing that pathway and we aren't going to consider alternatives at this point. In SS, not a perfectly good comparison, but not entirely unjustified. It, we can look at the difference between, for example, rocket launch technology before and after um, SpaceX. In, for 20 years, people had been saying, and longer, if only we, we could reuse rockets, it would be a lot cheaper to send stuff into space. But no one did anything about it until Elon Musk, no matter what your feelings about him, said, well, we could do that, went ahead and did it, and has now basically reduced the cost of launching things into space by a factor of 10 or 20. That's an enormous change. I mean, we haven't yet seen what the impacts will be, although, and not all of them are going to be good because we know there are concerns around launching thousands of satellites into orbit at the same time, but it's a transformational technology. And what we're talking about here is a transformational technology opportunity that people are just not addressing because they don't see it that way. When someone does, and if it actually works, the person who uh, makes that work is going to be a bit like Howard Hughes' father, who made all of his billions of dollars developing the first rotary oil and gas bit, which generated for his family billions of dollars in wealth and basically made the oil industry a real industry. I'm not obviously saying that we want to build another oil industry, but we know what we're tackling here as a problem that's in fact designed to tackle concerns around the environment in general. But it's basically the same type of barrier and the same type of opportunity at the end. And, and from, from terms of that uh, financial barrier, what is, you might have mentioned this specifically, but maybe we can talk a bit about, about it more in detail. The cost reduction that is gonna be necessary for this to be viable, I think you mentioned in your report something around like 90% or something like that from the current yeah. cost, is that, is we, that right? We figure of a factor of 10. You need to drop the cost, let's say of a 10 kilometer hole which currently might cost $100 million, we need it to cost $10 million, roughly speaking. Yes, so, yeah. now, so that sounds you know, crazily ambitious, but then when you look at the, at, at the way costs have come down for PV, solar, and wind, or you talk about the SpaceX example, uh, you, you know, as, as Ian pointed out at the beginning of this project, fracking costs have come down enormously. 
but it's partly because they are able to experiment by doing all the time. They drill tens of thousands of these wells a year and they learn a huge amount about how to drive the cost down. We need to start driving the cost down. We have every expectation as we've seen in these other areas, non-renewable generation, solar and wind, if we've seen with the SpaceX example, every expectation that uh, uh, with a focus on uh, deliberate focus on engineering and experimentation that the costs will drop very fast in this area too. I mean, <laughs> they're still using the three cone rotary drill bits to try to drill through granite. We know that's not going to work. I, I, I put myself through university and working in the oil patch in Alberta. I can remember putting these bits, I can remember tripping it out, in and out. And every time you ran into really hard rock, you had to change the bit sometimes every few hours. If you were down, say, 8,000 feet or so, you'd have to spend hours tripping out, to change the bit, drop it back in, drill for a few hours, pull it out again. This is crazy. Of course, we can do a lot better than this. And, and you're going to start cutting the cost very fast when you focus on developing new technology in this area. So before, we have a lot of questions from the audience, so we'll have around 20 minutes to and so that, but just one last question from me, I, it's more of a technical question. Ian, uh, I saw somewhere that like from a technical perspective, the deep uh, closed loops may have challenges when it comes to the actual heat transfer because it sort of uses conduction as opposed to convection. And that is basically like a physical limitation as that, won't, that you can't really overcome uh, in, the, in deep closed loops. Is that something that, is that a barrier there that you're considering or is this not what you're suggesting? Um, the, I, I ag agree with those assessments that there are some challenges. If you're essentially, if you think about it, it's like trying to build a radiator. So you drill a hole deep underground, pour water through the tube. If it's hot down there, the water will heat up and it'll come up the other side. Yeah. But of course you can only get heat transfer on the circumference of the tube. So there's a limited surface area for transferring heat from the rock to the water. Yeah. But if the rock is hot enough, then it won't really matter. So really the key is going to be to get enough little tubes and enough rock and enough, um, enough temperature so that it should work. So all of these things, they have challenges, but they also have ranges within which they're going to be perfectly sensible. So for example, if you could do the deep EGS stuff where you're drilling down to rockets at like two, 300 degrees Celsius, then a little tube should be fine because you should be able to pump enough water through the tube and slow enough that it can pick up heat from exceedingly hot rock. And then you get water coming out the other end that's going to be sufficiently hot for it to run your power generator. Sometimes we get all mixed up, we're all confused about the importance of, of uh, uh, temperature. But what really, it's not about temperature. Once you get above a certain temperature for the water coming up out of the well, what's really important is how much it costs to make that hot water. Mm. Because you can run a power station off of temperatures of say 130, 140 degrees Celsius. Not that hot, boiling, but not super hot. But if that water is really cheap, then yeah, you can do it. There are companies that do this today with waste heat from industrial processes. So all you need to do is get the cost of the water you pump up at a sufficient temperature to be low enough, and then you're fine. And then any of these technologies have a, will have a role in making it successful. And, and I guess, was that the key difference between like the shallow versus the deep? Like, is that really the, the, the key challenge here? Yeah, it's because basically getting the cost of getting the water out is all about drilling deep. And if you yeah. can't drill deep to get the temperature, if you, well, you can drill down really deep and get hot water up, but if it's costing you like, you know, a hundred dollars a gallon, forget it. But if yeah. you can do that and it costs you pennies a gallon, then you're like, you're like um, happy as a clown. You can do anything. So it's all about the cost of the cost of the water. If you think about it, it's basically just a big generator and power station on the top that runs off hot water. You just got to get cheap hot water into it and away you go. Yeah. And drilling deep also allows you to get away from those tectonically active zones. And so it, we, we believe it should largely eliminate the concern about induced seismicity. So you, you, uh, you can basically spread these plants out around the surface of the planet instead of having them co-located in frankly the worst place where yeah. you want to drill them. 
you've got to figure that building your power station next to a volcano is probably not the best combination of you know volcano and technology. Um, there have been a lot of really good science fiction movies about disasters caused by doing things like this. Not that those have happened, but you can see why you would want as a science fiction movie writer to script something like that. Yeah, I think, I don't know if Mustafar was that, but I, th I know. <laughs> okay, well, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering my questions, but we have 40 questions. I don't know if we can get all to all of them, but we'll definitely send them your way. And we have a bunch that have been upvoted. So it's still, you can still upvote any questions that you want to see on the top. And we'll just kind of try to go through. We have uh, around 20 minutes here. Um, so the first question is from uh, Maggie, and she's asking, I wonder what might happen if the ultra deep well bore hit a magma pocket and what are the chances of that happening? Can we see a small, can we see, can we see, can we see small magma pockets at depth on seismic? And the, the, the answer is yes, that could happen. Um, in fact, there have been drill, drilling experiments in Iceland where, of course, the magma pockets are much lower where the drill hit magma and the answer then is stop drilling basically <laughs> because you can't go any further when the magma is pouring up into your borehole and typically all of these technologies have easy mechanisms for stopping a blowout for example so you're not going to get a uh, the stuff pushing all the way to the surface um, so yes there are all sorts of things that um, as with any drilling operation can be problematic um, either hitting rock that's too hard to drill through so you can't drill through it or hitting a rock formation that's not the one you expected so that you can't actually build a reservoir once you get a will down there. Or you can hit, um, hit magma much more shallower than you expected and find that this doesn't work as a site. So there are a number of these other um, both explorational aspects that need to be understood better and uh, well, I guess you could say reservoir construction aspects that will need to be fleshed out. But you can only do that once you can drill down that deep to try it. I mean, many of these things have been, uh, problems like this have been seen in shallower wells where it's possible to drill down to the depths to see these things. So we know there are in principle technical solutions. We just don't know in practice how they're gonna play out at depth and if there are any differences we need to worry about. Thanks again. Uh, second question here is what is the typical megawatt power production from a deep well? That it varies hugely um, depending on the, uh, depending both on the um, flow rate of the water through the reservoir that you build and the temperature of the reservoir. I can't actually give you a good answer for that. Um, I can, um, because I honestly don't know what the range might be. I mean, I know geothermal power stations vary in ranges from 20 or 30 megawatts up to you know, one and a half to two gigawatts, but they scale it up simply by drilling more wells. They, uh, it's not like they drill bigger wells to make it, um, to get more money per well or more water per well. They simply drill more wells, move them further away from the ones they got, drill down to some more hot rock and scale up that way. But no, I'm sorry. They be essentially become modular. I mean, it yeah. may not be perfectly modular, but certainly you have that, if you're in the right spot, you have that type of scalability opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let me just add something to that. I think it, it needs to be clear that we don't actually have any ultra deep geothermal power plants yes. yet. <laughs> so it's a, it's a question still to be answered. But what we can say is that with a conventional shallow hydrothermal geothermal, which is what you see, for instance, in the geysers plant in California, They're, they can generate huge amounts of power. Now, uh, the wells at geysers are what, three kilometers or so in sedimentary, yeah, sedimentary yeah. rocky and right. Yeah. So, you know, that plant, which has something like 80 wells, I was looking, checking it out online, is, is has the capacity of 1.5 gigawatts, gigawatt. Uh, and uh, it's, there's no reason in principle why uh, if, you, if, you are, if you have a ultra deep facility somewhere that you couldn't be generating equivalent amounts of power. Um, you're just, you just have to go deeper for it. That's the yep. whole point. Um, and if you can get the well cost uh, down to the, an area roughly approximate to the well cost for do, drilling the geysers well, 
in, in California through the geyser power plant, then you, you, you just proliferate the wells across the landscape and ultimately generate as much power as you're seeing there. So uh, uh, um, it all depends ultimately, as Ian has been arguing on uh, getting those drill co drilling costs down. And, and actually, the, so the only two, look, there's two locations where there's been like some deep uh, drilling in Russia and Germany, is that correct? That they stopped because it was got, the temperatures were too high or something? There's, there have been three or four deep drilling projects. There's one in, Ru in Russia, its name has slipped my mind. And I think they got just around 12 kilometers down. But with a hole, was, a hole about what? Five centimeters, six centimeters yes, across or something yes. like that. It, yeah. was a, it was a small hole. There is a project in uh, Iceland where they got, I think, eight kilometers down where they hit, um, hit magma and stopped. And there is a project in Germany that ran over, well, all of these projects actually ran over many years in Germany where they got, I think, nine or 10 kilometers down. Um, so those are the deepest drilling projects. There was one in the United States called Project Moho back in the 60s, and I think they got seven kilometers down. They were drilling uh, off in the ocean, actually. Um, but they were all, these are all essentially experimental projects. I mean, yeah. experimental drilling activities. So we pulled from those studies our estimates of what it would cost to drill a deep well. But, with a conventional uh, technology. With conventional technology. But the... Um, uh, so, and that's where we got our roughly a hundred million dollars to drill a deep well of that size. Mm -hmm. We got a few more questions here, so I'll try to go through them. Uh, the remote locations needed for conventional geothermal handicaps it's from by not being able to monetize the low quality heat that exists from the low pressure side of the turbine. So, might EGS have the potential to eliminate this remoteness handicap and allow low quality heat to be used for district heating, drying, and greenhouses? Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's the common practice in places like Iceland, where I think a huge percentage of the residential and commercial heating and greenhouse heating is provided as a, a, a side effect of the benefit of the power station. Mm. So yeah, it could work that way as well. And we had some conversations early on in this project with a colleague who's quite fascinated uh, and really excited by the opportunity of, of small Jeep small geothermal power stations in the Arctic, because you could have a geothermal power station there that could provide small amounts of local electricity because small communities don't need huge amounts of electricity, but you have the side benefit of providing large amounts of residual heat that you could use for heating, which is now provided by flown in propane tanks and ridiculously expensive heating options that are also horribly um, carbon intensive. So would that essentially like increase the overall, overall efficiency of it because now you're getting the thermal benefits as well as it, opposed to just electrical? It certainly could. I mean, we didn't think about running business cases for that because we were focused simply on trying to understand how we could get the first problem solved, the electricity one, because that's where the broader yeah. range of opportunity lies. But yeah, they're, they're, I would see with any technology like that, big side benefit opportunities that um, people don't think about today. Um, because they simply aren't accessible. I mean, in some cases, people, companies do use the residual waste from thermal power stations, provide local industrial heating or heat up, you know, you, you set up a, a factory nearby that requires waste heat for drying and you can take that off of the power station's output. Great. So another question here is Australia spent a lot of money on geothermal without success. Do we know why? It's a good question. And the answer is, I don't know why. Um, in terms of deep EGS, the answer would be because they weren't doing it. So we, their, their, success, their efforts were based on standard geothermal energy approaches. And in that case, as we were talking about earlier, the locations that you need to find are very rare and very difficult to take advantage of. And uh, they simply were unable to find sites, as far as I can tell, that let them produce energy in quantities that made sense economically using standard technologies. Um, there's also an economic um, barrier as well, because um, power systems 
get used to a, in fact, any large business gets used to a particular way of doing something. So trying to introduce a brand new thing that's quite different from what they use today can be very difficult. I mean, I mean, it's a natural response, but for example, if you look for something like, well, let's take BC Hydro or Ontario or Hydro Quebec, you can probably consider that when you talk to them about power, they both think of hydro because of course it's the natural energy source for them. So it's very hard to think outside the box and look at something very speculative when you already have a business model that's focused on something. So one of the challenges that we've identified here, for example, is that, yes, you can think of developing a project to generate electricity using geothermal energy, but it's very hard to get buy-in from the stakeholders you need to actually make that a, a to have somewhere to sell it to so you can actually make it a viable business opportunity long-term. So I think this really raises something, and both of us have already alluded to this, but we need to really hammer the point home. When people talk about geothermal and conventional conversations, they're thinking of a particular technology, shallow hydrothermal in sedimentary basins. We are talking about something very distinct. So what often happens in these conversations, Mo, and I think you're getting at this point, is people say, oh, wow, well, we've tried geothermal. And, you know, I was talking to a BC, senior BC, uh, uh, a deputy minister here recently, and she said, oh, well, we've got geothermal enrichment, you know, and, and, and the two categories get conflated, or actually yeah. people assume that what they, they understand by geothermal, when we talk about geothermal, is conventional geothermal, but that's not the case. We're talking about something very distinct, very different. So one of the ways, it's all, it's all about framing, the kind of labeling you use. I think the term deep EGS, it's technical, it's, it's, uh, it's not easily understood. You have to actually take the acronym and unpack it, enhanced geothermal systems, deep enhanced geothermal systems. Instead, we're using the label increasingly ultra deep geothermal to make it really simple and really distinct. This is a kind of technology that would make this, that would be radically different from existing geothermal, at least in terms of the depth that we're talking about. Thanks, Thomas. So a question here uh, re related to comparing to other technologies, uh, is it enough to match size and cost of SMR nuclear? So I'm assuming what they mean here is how does it compare in terms of size and the cost? And we might have alluded to this a bit, but maybe you can answer it more directly. You want me to take a crack at that first, Ian? Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll get, I'm just thinking which one to push at first. I mean, and there's, there's some similarities and differences. I mean, I mean, as you alluded to, you can think of geothermal as modular in the sense that you just, if, it, if the site works, you just keep drilling more wells to scale it up to more power capacity, which in principle you can do with small modular reactors. They both give you energy on, you know, in, you can scale from small to larger by just adding to it. But the technology has, I mean, they're fundamentally different technologies with fundamentally different um, cost and risk profiles. And also one thing they share is that neither of them exist yet. The ultra deep geothermal doesn't exist yet. And SMRs don't exist yet either. They're people's ideas of what we want, but we haven't actually got one operating yet. So it's also in some ways just this uh, emerging as uh, ultra deep geothermal would be. Tad, over to you. Um, yes, so uh, SMRs would certainly have a, a power density advantage. Uh, small reactors, enormous amounts of power generated per square meter of the territory they occupy. Even taking the entire manufacturing complex that goes into producing the SMR, the power density would still be uh, would still be a winning factor. On the other hand, there was an important paper that was published just a few weeks ago from uh, proceedings of the Natural uh, National Academy of Sciences in the United States PNAS that suggests that. Uh, all envisioned uh, small modular nuclear reactor technologies will have much more significant waste disposal problems uh, than existing uh, nuclear reactor technology, in part because the toxicity of the waste will be a lot higher, and in part because extracting it and, and disposing it will, will be more complex. Disposing of it will be more complex. Um, so uh, I, 
uh, I, the thing about the thing about nuclear type technology is that it's a relatively unforgiving, highly capital intensive technology, uh, and we we. we we know something about how unforgiving it is and how vulnerable it is to the surrounding social context that sustains it by the fact that we get this frigid of fear every time fighting starts up around the reactors in Ukraine. Uh, and the concern for the not just Ukraine, but Europe as a whole, if one of those reactors is not adequately uh, maintained or sustained. Now, small modular nuclear reactors might uh, be more resilient to that kind of disruption in the external social and economic and technological context. But why should we be relying on a, upon a technology that is uh, uh, that carries such risks associated with it? Uh, I, I think I think that I, I, I think we need to invest in all of these possibilities. We need to have a lot of different arrows in our quiver as we move forward. So I would be a strong supporter of research. Uh, and investment in small modular nuclear reactors. But uh, I think there are enough question marks already associated with nuclear reactor technology in general and these new technologies specifically that uh, uh, we shouldn't put all our eggs in that basket, that's for sure. And we don't have much time here, but I wanted to just, this last question. Uh, recent rotary uh, drilling pilots at the forge site have shown promise using new PDC bit designs to increase ROP and run life, including for deviated wells. Do you see rotary drilling advances as another pathway to the potential $10 million well? Absolutely. I mean, I focused on the ones that were novel and interesting and that came up as essentially fundamental fundamentally transformatively different technologies than the ones we use today. Uh, I would, I mean, these guys who build rotary drilling technology and have been doing amazing things to push the technology to where it is today. And I wouldn't put it past anyone to find a, meth a mechanism to adapt current rotary drilling technology or augmenting it with some of the other ones we've talked about today to make something that's even more efficient. This, there, there's, um, I guess the best way to put it is that in order to accomplish this type of audacious goal, we need to basically throw everything we have in our toolkit at it and add new tools we haven't thought of before. And there's nothing that can be ruled out and everything needs to be tried because it doesn't make sense just to pick a few that you think you're going to win. It just doesn't work that way in real life. So yeah, it sure it could work. It'd be great if it did. Awesome, great. Well, thank you. Uh, we're almost at time here, so I want to conclude today's webinar and thank uh, thank you very much for everyone to for attending and special thanks to both of you, uh, Dr. Ian Graham and Dr. Thomas Homer Dixon, for joining us and sharing your insights and thoughts. Uh, and I think this is a great way to sort of uh, talk about this and, and share uh, perspectives and also hear from different people that have different perspective from the energy uh, sector and from the net zero pathways assessments that everybody's been thinking about. So the recording of this webinar is gonna be available uh, on the Transition Accelerator's YouTube channel by tomorrow. So be sure also to join uh, our webinars. It's the last Wednesday of, of every month. We're gonna, we're gonna be off uh, for the next couple of months, but we're gonna be back in September. And you can join also our mailing list by going to transitionaccelerator.ca or follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn. And uh, Ian, uh, Thomas, any last words before we uh, wrap it up? Not for me. I thought this was, uh, well, this was f enjoyable to do and the questions were wonderful. So thank you very much for everyone's interest. And, and just a thanks to the Transition Accelerator for giving us the platform to expand our audience and help develop this uh, community of intent or community of interest that we're working to build around this idea. So thank you very much. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. And uh, uh, please keep an eye on the YouTube channel if you want to share this uh, with anyone that you think might be interested.